Appreciate it. Those of you watching online, you can pull up the outline, the Life Church webpage or Facebook page. Those of you this morning, you've got it in front of you. Uh, as you know, last Sunday we uh, started uh, the parable uh, of Lazarus and the rich man, and we got uh, through it partial. And uh, we don't want to just hit the pause button and you know let it drift off. But I believe that what Jesus is saying. In Luke 16, man, all of us need to be reminded of eternity because it is so easy to get caught up in today, tomorrow, and yesterday, and we forget what's most important. So we're grateful for his word. Those of you um, that have already picked up your communion cups, you're going to hang on to them. I know historically we do communion on the front end, but we're going to mess with you today. We're going to put it on the back end. I know it's going to freak you out, but believe me, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. So if you didn't get, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's the only prerequisite we have that you can participate uh, in communion. And if you don't know Jesus, uh, that's okay. Nobody's got a camera zooming in on you, but uh, that's one of the prerequisites that we put our faith in Christ And by taking communion, we're reminded of what Jesus did on the cross, and we celebrate that, that great thing. So uh, if you have it, you might want to put it down on the floor by your, the leg of your chair. Don't step on it. It'll explode, and white powder will go everywhere. (laughs) Not really, not really. Joshua Rogers is a um, Christian author. Uh, he travels uh, and he tells this particular story that he observed happen in his house growing up. The uh, telephone rang and his mom answered and his mom never could imagine the news that his grandfather was about to to tell the family. Josh said, my dad's two children from his first marriage had died in a plane crash. That's the news that came across. Scotty and Ronnie Rogers, ages 10 and 14, were last seen with their mom and stepdad on July 5th, 1981, when they took off in a small aircraft en route to Florida for a family vacation. But the plane never made it. It was reported that uh, the plane went through a thunderstorm, uh, dropped off the radar, and crashed into the Gulf of Mexico, leaving no trace of the wreckage. He said, when my mom got off the phone, she told my dad. My dad walked out of the room, found a cassette tape with the old hymn, It Is Well With My Soul on it. He put the cassette tape in the player and hit play and sang with the people that were singing the hymn. That particular hymn, by the way, was written back in 1873 by Horatio Spafford, who, whose four daughters drowned in a ship when they were crossing the Atlantic en route to Europe. And so Spafford was on his way to comfort his grieving wife in Europe when around that area where the ship went down with his four daughters, he wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It's hard to believe that when that hymn was written over 100 years later, that song would minister to Josh's dad and their family. As Spafford grieved, so Josh's father was grieving, and he sang, It is well with my soul. Thirteen years after the accident, Josh says that his dad and Josh's brother, Caleb, and Josh went to Biloxi, 
Mississippi, and after eating breakfast at a restaurant, his dad and brother walked the beach together, looking out over the Gulf of Mexico, realizing that that was the graveyard where their younger brothers had perished. He said, we talked, my dad, my brother, and I. We sang old hymns together, and suddenly my dad stopped walking. He was unable to sing or speak anymore, and he looked at my brother and myself, and he put his arms around us and held us very close. Tears were streaming down his face, and we somehow, Josh says, understood the two remaining children of our dad were standing next to our siblings' graveyard, and that we were hearing the sounds of a grown man's broken heart. Looking out over the gulf, my dad managed to speak these words, ain't God good, boys? We shook our heads up and down, agreeing with him. Yeah, Dad. Yep. You're right. But later that night, my brother Caleb and I were in the car together, and Caleb just kind of burst out saying, that's screwed up, man. His kids are dead, and he's talking about how good God is. How can that be? It's messed up. Dad's messed up. And Caleb's outburst, man, is a reminder, you might be here in the auditorium this morning or watching online, and that's the cry of so many people in our world today where their hearts are breaking over their own losses. You know what you've gone through. You know what you've experienced. It might be a devastating diagnosis. It might be rejection by people that you thought loved you. But all kinds of open wounds you carry with yourself, and they haven't healed. And whatever your loss may be, it will be a test of faith when we ask ourselves, can God really be good if he will allow me to hurt so much? It's a good question. Can God really be good if he'll allow me to hurt so much? When Jesus disciples, some of them deserted Jesus in John 6, and Jesus turned to the 12, and he asked, are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. That's a good reminder. And I'll tell you, friends, um, Josh Rogers' father I believe is a good model for all of us to land in our world today. There's a lot of stuff in this world that doesn't make sense. There's a lot of things that you and I experience that just doesn't seem to add up. And can we continue to say that God is good? Like Josh's dad did. As some of these disciples that Jesus had encountered, they didn't agree or feel comfortable with the direction that Jesus was going in his teaching, and so they, they checked out. Yes, there are people in 2024 doing the very same thing. You, know? you say, that's enough. I can't take this anymore. God's not fair. And you point your finger at God and say, I'm going to walk away. And I want to encourage you today not to do that. Not to do that. And so we've got to ask ourselves, if there's no good answer for our pain, will we leave Christ behind? Because Jesus is the only one that can speak plainly to your pain and my pain. He's the only one. Because he himself has experienced tremendous pain when he was on this planet. Isaiah 53.3, he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with deepest grief. Jesus understands what you're going through and have gone through. And he is the one that we need to anchor into and be able to say at the end of the day, God is good. He's good. He's good. 
Because he allowed his one and only son to go to the cross and pay for my sin debt in full so that when we put our trust in him, we can have a relationship with him and spend a decade, a millennia, no, forever and ever with him. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. But. And so until that day when Jesus comes, we can sing... And Lord, haste the day when our faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Even now, you can cry out before the Lord, man. Tell him how you feel. Tell him the doubts that you're experiencing. He can handle it. He can handle it. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 16. We're going to pick it up um, in verse 19. It's in your notes. It's on the screen. If you have your Bibles, you want to track as well. Jesus said there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. And finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. And the rich man also died and was buried. And he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in a far distance with Lazarus at his side. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that we can trust your word. Lord, we thank you that we can trust you with our lives. And today we, man, Lord, we've sung about it, the importance of allowing you to work in us, to change us. Will you do that, Lord? Sometimes we don't like ourselves by the way we live and respond. And that's why we need your help to live well as we allow you to live through us. Those watching online and in this building, Lord, that don't know you, may your spirit tap their shoulder in a very personal way that individuals would put their trust in you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Like Josh Rogers' father hitting the cassette player, it is well with my soul. After hearing that his two sons had died in an airplane crash, so it was with Lazarus, this man that we just read about in Luke 16. I'd like to take a few moments to drill down a little deeper in his life. When you look at verses 20 and 21, It says, at his gate, at the rich man's gate, lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. And as Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from a rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Friend, Lazarus would hit play on the cassette player that was next to him by the gate of the rich man. Day after day, day after day. He was poor, he was paralyzed, he had sores all over his body, and he would sing, it is well with my soul. Because when you read this text, this story that Jesus tells, you don't hear a word out of Lazarus. You don't see him picketing at the gate, life's not fair. You don't hear him screaming at the people that are walking by him, screaming at the rich man, will you give me some of your food? No. Lazarus, the poor man, paralyzed, sore-filled body, alone. You don't hear a peep out of him pointing his finger at God. He would hit the play button on the cassette player and sing day after day it is well with my soul that's why there's something 
profound about maintaining a grateful heart. By maintaining a grateful heart, you lean into the goodness of God. You see the goodness of God, even in difficult challenges. And so, Lazarus, you know what? God, you know what his name means? God is my help. And that seems kind of, is this a joke? You know, Lazarus sitting by the gate. Is this a joke, God? My parents name me, God is my help. And everybody that knew Lazarus and they saw the conditions that he was living under, they would mock him. What a joke, they would say. You're still believing in a God who lets you live a life where you're paralyzed, where your body's filled with sores, where you're hungry day after day. Is God fair? They'd get in his face and they challenge him. Don't you think it's time to walk away from God? Lazarus chose to stay strong in his faith, even in challenging times. Just like Josh Rogers' father, man, it is well with my soul. You dig deep into your core when the crises come. Lazarus had to do that. Craig Rochelle As a pastor and author, he writes, as a pastor, I'm often confronted by death. One thing I've observed is that when someone dies, that person's loved ones want to believe their relative went to a better place. They'll say things like, she wasn't a religious person, but deep down she had a good heart. Or, he wasn't a saint, but he did some good things. That's where the rich man would lean in. And when it comes to death and eternity, it's human nature to hope for the best and avoid contemplating the worst. That's why a lot of, in our culture today, friends, we're so consumed with noise that it prevents our minds from stopping and reflecting on, is it well with my soul? We don't have time to think like that, but we should. We should. Even followers of Christ will say, you know what? Yeah, I know heaven is there, but I'm not, I, want to, I want to live a little longer here on planet Earth. If Jesus comes tomorrow, I wish he'd wait. Heaven can wait, you know? Heaven can wait. Um, some people think that heaven's going to be like a long church service, you know? It just never ends. Not true, not true. Psalm 8410, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand Anywhere else. Anywhere else. And so, when you think about, you know, sometimes I think when I was growing up, uh, uh, Debbie and I were down in the Chicago area Friday. Our niece had a wedding and driving through some of the old neighborhoods in Chicago, they have bungalow houses that, you know, you... It's a very simple house, three bedrooms, one bathroom, and a kitchen, living room. But they're all the same, you know? She lived in that house, and I lived in the same. And so we we commented about that. You know, remember when we were growing up? You know, you could spit from your bedroom to the house next door, you know? And I remember the sidewalk between our houses, there was like dirt where grass couldn't grow because the the sun couldn't hit it. So I play with my plastic army men. For hours at a time, man, I would build battle scenes, you know, and line them up and strategize on the campaigns that we were going to have for victory. Victory. And as a kid, man, it was like I was in a dream world, you know. And so when I think about that, and, you know, those were great days. Those were great days. Uh, No regrets, man. But when you think about life without sin, life without sickness, death, mourning, or pain, how does that sound to you? Huh? 
Revelation 21, 4 and 5, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I, I am making everything new. I'm making everything new. And so the, the lyrics of Amazing Grace, you know, the last verse, when we've been there 10,000 years, woo, 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We should almost sing that, but we won't. <laughs> when we've been there 10,000 years, that just, it's hard to comprehend. It's hard to calculate. It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. And so, picking it up at number five, you can see the blanks have been filled in. Uh, From last week, um, the rich man shouts in verse 24. And I was thinking about if I was the rich man and I was in the torment side of Hades, I'd probably do some shouting too, wouldn't you? Yes or no? Yeah, we kind of lean into some shouting. And so we need to give the rich man, yeah, we we can understand why he would be shouting here. Father Abraham, have pity. The rich man shouted. And the one he was saying, have pity, it was an emotional plea. He was, he was saying, man, Abraham, will you have some compassion on me? We're hearing that in our culture today too, by the way. You got to have compassion on people. I get it. I get it. Jesus had compassion on people too. But when it's a sinful lifestyle, friends, Jesus confronted that. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, he did. He did. He stayed engaged. He didn't say, oh, you know, I'm gonna, you're a nice person. I'm just going to. No, he, he confronted sin. And we, you know, I'm not talking about being judgmental, but I'm talking about as a follower of Jesus Christ, we should have core values on how we live our lives. And if people are not followers of Christ, they're going to sin, Right? That's, that's what they do. So we pray for people that are not followers of Christ, that they would see the light of Christ and put their faith in Jesus, and he will transform their lives like he's transforming each of our lives. And how cool that is. So have pity. Two, cool my tongue. He asked for help. The rich man never asked for help before. Man, he had all the money in the world. He had... Everything at ease, at his fingertips. But now he's calling for help. That's something new for him. Saying, send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger. Three, I'm in anguish. That word anguish means to be in agony. And so this rich man is experiencing some stuff. Number six, Abraham says, I can't help. So the rich man's calling out, will you help me, man? I'm, I'm in torment, I'm in agony. Will you help me? And we, we would say, well, that's, that's not nice of Abraham. He should help. Well, he can't, and he tells why. Son, remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he's here being comforted and you're in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. So, sub point one, Abraham is saying to the rich man, remember back, remember. Which says, even when you are dead, your body's dead, and your spirit and your soul are living, you can still remember. You have a mind to remember the past. Keep that in mind. I think of people that would have heard the gospel and they rejected it over and over again and remembering that. The times they sat in church and they never responded to Christ. The memories of that. So he hasn't lost his his memory. And even Abraham's response to the rich man, he calls him son, my child. It's It's... 
It's compassionate sorrow, man. Abraham probably saying, man, I wish you would have put your faith in God. I wish you would have done that when you were alive. Number two, you had everything and Lazarus had nothing. Abe, Abe, just a footnote, Abraham was wealthy when he lived. You read through Genesis, God blessed him. God blessed him. And so when you look at eternity, some may think, well, the rich man, because he had his wealth, that's what kept him out of heaven. No, no, no. Abraham was wealthy. And he's in paradise at this time. So money has nothing to do with it. And because Lazarus was poor, you know, it's not, you know, the reverse here. You, you're rich on earth, you're going to be on the torment side. No, no. It, it all comes down to your soul, the decision you made. Did you receive Christ or did you reject him? Number three, a great chasm separates us. What I find interesting, when you, re- when you read this story, you can just read it and miss some key thoughts. And, and this kind of hit me in verse 26. And besides, there is a great chasm. It doesn't say, and there was a chasm. Okay, a chasm is intimidating. But when he says, a great chasm, whoa, it's great. It's great chasm. Woo! A lot of distance there. And Abraham explains to the rich man, you know, I cannot send Lazarus. I know you're asking, uh, you're asking for Lazarus, the dude that sat at your gate every single day. He cannot come because there is a great chasm separating us. Now, last week we hit this where when Jesus... Uh, Went to the cross, and for three days his body was buried in Ephesians 4. That It says he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. That clearly means that Christ also descended into our lowly world. So when he was in the grave, he went to Hades, the paradise side, took the captives that were in paradise, and and he brought them to heaven. So paradise is empty right now. The torment side of Hades is still there. And it will be there until the, the great white throne judgment that we read about in Revelation. So paradise is empty. There's a vacant sign in front of it. And, and we'll get into that. Because when Jesus went to the cross on that Good Friday, he paid for the sin debt. He shed his blood, which gave the freedom to take those that were on the good side of Hades and paradise and bring them to heaven. And today we see, like, for example, Stephen in Acts 7, he was talking to the religious community and they were freaking out because he had a relationship with Jesus. And Stephen says in verse 51, you stubborn people, Do you know there are stubborn people in this room right now? There are stubborn people watching online who week after week push against what God wants to do in their lives. And Stephen was addressing that. They were very religious, but they had no relationship with Christ. And so he says, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist, resist. So the, the stubbornness comes from resisting, resisting the Holy Spirit. That you're, what your ancestors did and, and, and so do you. And they, the Jewish leaders were so ticked off at Stephen, it says that they shook their fist at him in rage. Verse 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. That's where Jesus is right now. And he told them, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Verse 59, they stoned Stephen. They didn't want to to hear what he had to say anymore. They killed him. 
And as he's dying, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He didn't say receive my body. His body will decay, but his spirit will live forever. Receive my spirit. And he fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And then he died. Stephen understood that when he stopped breathing, his spirit would go to be where Jesus was. The same with you and me today. The body dies, our spirit goes to heaven. Aren't you glad for that? For sure. And so, just a a footnote, the great white throne, Revelation 20, you want to read that? Paul talks about our bodies being like a tent for all you campers out there, which I was at one time, not anymore. Not anymore. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, not with human ends. Aren't you looking forward to that? Man, that's good. And so you can read that chapter. Thank you, Lord. Number seven, the rich man's appeal. Verse 27, then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. You hear this um, from people, those, you know, when you talk to them about, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna go to hell, and I'm, all my friends are going to be there. You hear, that's pretty common, isn't it? Well, this kind of pulls back the curtain like, the rich man, why wouldn't he want his five brothers to be where he is? Right? If it's so great. Right? Why isn't he producing commercials for the torment side of Hades? You need to come here, man, where I'm at. This is wonderful. No, he's not. He's saying... I, There's no exit signs in the torment side of Hades, friends. No exit signs. You're there. You're there. You're not going to get out. And so um, there's no parole. There's no probation for this rich man. He will be eternally separated from God. So... He doesn't ask his brothers, you know, can you tell my brothers to pray for my release? He knows he's not going anywhere. 1 Timothy 6.21, it's kind of a, some of these people have missed the most important thing in life. They don't know God. They don't know God. And so, here's a case of a man who's on the torment side of Hades, and he's got more evangelistic fervor than a lot of believers do. He wants somebody to tell his brothers about God because he knows his family well enough. There was no interest in God, having a relationship with God. Zero. Zero. And so if if an unbeliever could come back from the dead today, Um, they would preach the gospel. Like Charles Darwin, uh, some of you heard about him in school. Uh, He would say, don't read my book. Don't believe what I said. You need to believe in Jesus Christ. That's what he would say. Like this rich man, he would echo that. You don't want to come here. Darwin died in 1882, man. And yet his teachings are being pushed in schools all over. Number eight, God's word is the answer. Verse 29, but Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham. But if someone is sent from them, from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Abraham thought "Mm, otherwise from the rich man's request. He didn't agree with him. 
He said, those who are still alive have God's word. You have God's word. I have God's word. Case in point, going back to um, 1978, New York City. New York City was paralyzed in the summer of 1977. Why? Because there was a man, David Berkowitz, who was a killer on the, on the loose. Son of Sam, he nicknamed himself. He killed six, he wounded seven over the summer. An intense manhunt and widespread public panic went through New York. And he was arrested in 1977. He was given six life sentences, 365 consecutive years in prison. But in prison, that man, after spending 10 years in prison, somebody gave him a Gideon's New Testament. Did he resist? No. He started reading it. He read it. And after reading it, David Berkowitz, son of Sam, put his faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, I have no interest, still in prison today, by the way. Do you see the countenance change on that dude? Hmm? You know why? Because Jesus transformed him from the inside. God's word, God's word was enough. I have no interest in parole and no plans to seek release. If you could understand this, I am already a free man. I am not saying this jokingly. I really am. Jesus has already forgiven and pardoned me, and I believe it. God's word is enough, man. You have it. Berkowitz, man, he helps out in the chapel in the prison. <laughs> Does Bible studies. He shares his faith with other inmates. He's enjoying his time as an ambassador of Jesus Christ in prison. He allowed Jesus to change him. David Berkowitz, by the way, is Jewish, like the rich man. And he realized Jesus is the Messiah, that he died in his place for his sins and has experienced the forgiveness of heaven. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. Will you do that, friend? Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. And Jesus made it clear the rich man was lost. Lazarus was saved for all eternity. And that's a decision, a choice that you and I have to make. If you were going to buy a plane ticket, some of you maybe have done that, you don't get to choose where you want to go once you've boarded the plane. Like this ticket, they're going from New York to London. You can't get on the plane and say, hey, pilot, Mr. Pilot, I don't want to go to London. I'd like to go to Hawaii. Can you... Turn this plate in around. No, that doesn't work like that, right? Once you buy your ticket, the decision's been made where you're going to go. And while you're breathing air on this planet, God is giving you an opportunity to decide where you want to spend eternity. Jesus has paid for your ticket to heaven with his blood. And you need to put your faith and trust in him and say, yes, Lord, you're my savior. You took my place. You're my substitute. And today I'm putting all my faith in you. Worship team is going to come. And as they're getting ready, Sergeant Jacob de Chazer was a crew member for Doolittle's Raiders in 1942. Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th, 1941 by the Japanese and uh, President Franklin Roosevelt wanted to get back at the Japanese Empire as quick as possible. They got a group of 80 young men who volunteered for this high-risk uh, 
airplanes being gutted pretty much to take off from an aircraft carrier to bomb Tokyo to say America is still alive and thriving. The Shazer's airplane ran out of fuel. They had a crash land in Chinese-occupied territory by the Japanese. And so he and his crew were taken as POWs. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. They were half-starved. They were placed in solitary confinement. He said... Six months after our capture, three of my very close friends were killed by a firing squad. Fourteen months after that, another of my friends, Bob Meter, who was a follower of Jesus, died from starvation. It was then, Jacob said, after Bob Meter died, that the Holy Spirit began to work in my life. Like, why do people hate each other so much? Because one of the reasons why Jacob de Chazer signed up is that he hated Japan for bombing Pearl Harbor. He hated them. He hated the Japanese people. So he thought he could get back at them. And the way he was treated in the POW camp, he hated them even more. And so he... He said, I began to ponder the cause of such hatred between members of the human race. I wondered what it was that made the Japanese hate the Americans and what made me hate the Japanese. My thoughts turned toward what I had heard about Christianity, changing hatred between human beings into real brotherly love. And I was gripped with a strange longing to examine the Christian's Bible to see if I could find the secret. I begged my captors to get a Bible for me And last May 1944, a guard gave me a Bible and told me I could have it for only three weeks. And I read, I read page after page. And on June 8th, 1944, the words of Romans 10.9 stood boldly before me where I had a decision to make. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it was then, that at that time, after reading the Bible, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Something strange began to happen to me. The hate that I had for my captors began to change. I began to see them differently through the eyes of Christ. And I began to ask God to help me forgive the guards that had tortured me. Help me, Lord, to forgive them. As you forgave those that put you on the cross, Lord, help me model that well in this dark place. And he saw a change. August 20th, 1945, POW camp was liberated. Jacob went back to the United States to heal and after that went to Bible school. And while in Bible school, he said, the Lord said, go teach the Japanese people the way of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he did. He went back to Japan telling his story and how sins could be forgiven. And you want to know something cool, friends? The Japanese pilot that planned the assault on Pearl Harbor, survived World War II. When he came back to Japan, he had heard about Jacob de Chazar's story. And after Jacob told his story to this Japanese pilot, he himself put his faith in Christ. Yeah. And Fuchida, the pilot, became an evangelist in Japan and traveled all over the world telling people about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. What a day. And so this morning, when we put our faith in Christ, we have experienced his forgiveness. And you might be here today and you've got hatred like Jacob de Chazer had toward the Japanese people. You might hate your spouse this morning. It's possible. There might be a sibling. There might be a relationship. 
that you need to let go and, be, and, and forgive them, asking the Lord, just like Jacob had to ask the Lord to help forgive those, those guards in the POW camp. God's justice demands that sin be punished. And here we are on planet Earth and God's in heaven and in the middle you have Jesus on the cross with two criminals. Two criminals. Both started out to mock Jesus, make fun of him. But when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what we're doing. Take a look in Luke 23. One of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed, so you're in the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself on us too. And while you're at it, but the other criminal protested, don't you fear God? And this other criminal had earlier been mocking Christ. But God's work in him softened his heart, and he said, We deserve desire for our our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And he said to Jesus, remember me, Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, it's too late, man, too late. You've committed too many crimes, it's hopeless. (sighs) Too late, man. No, Jesus said, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what Jesus did. So, Father, we thank you as we prepare for communion. We're grateful for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for your word that exposes our sins, Lord. We see your word and it shows us how we should live and follow after you. We thank you, Lord, for your promises. You've given us everything we need to walk a godly life, and we are grateful for that. I pray for every person in this room or online, Lord, if they have never put their faith in Christ, today they will say, Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. You took my place on the cross as my substitute. I'm putting all my faith in you today. Thank you for forgiving.